Last year, my theme in the Kermit Roosevelt series was one of failures of imagination. So what I'd like to do by way of beginning this year is to uh, review a few of the events of the past year and think about whether we experienced any failures of imagination. So, of course, the first image that I'd like to see displayed there is an image of Iraq. And I would suggest to you that what we've seen in Iraq is the culmination of eight years of effort uh, to the point now where we really do f not only feel but physically see the Iraqi security forces becoming much more capable of providing their own security. And that is a trend that I would suggest wasn't a failure of imagination at all, but rather a vindication of imagination. In Afghanistan, the challenge has been and continues to be different. Uh, they are not the same campaign, as we all know. Um, our approach there is equally to turn over responsibility and stability security to the Afghan National Security Forces. There's been enormous progress made at the tactical level, but that progress has been harder to link together, to knit together into progress at the national level. Uh, and so there I think, though as well, I think our imagination is, is quite sound in the approach, but potentially and, and in actuality more difficult to deliver. Then we have, of course, the Arab Spring that General Sir Peter mentioned as well. And here I think maybe our imaginations are just beginning to touch the edges of what that might mean uh, to security not only in the, in the Middle East, but how that, uh, whatever, whatever evolves through this thing called the Arab Spring, how that will affect uh, the global commons not just the, the narrow Middle East itself. And so there maybe we would suggest that we haven't used our imaginations to the extent that they may require to be used. And then of course there's some natural disasters. Earthquake with a near nuclear disaster in Japan. Um, I would suspect that as those who are constructing the protection against such natural disasters might look back and say, we didn't imagine it could get this difficult. Tornadoes in the United States, historic, uh, historic natural disasters really. Floods in the United States that are the worst since the uh, early part of the 20th century. Um, another volcano in Iceland that almost kept me from arriving here on time. Uh, which, by the way, exa ha happened exactly a year ago. And then, of course, the uh, killing of Osama bin Laden, a great moment uh, in terms of taking the leadership of Al-Qaeda and uh, creating difficulties for that organization. But there's also the undertone that these kind of organizations are actually, in some way, leaderless organizations. And so I don't know that we've uh, yet uh, come to understand what his particular demise might mean and what it could mean for the future. And speaking of the future, there was of course the prediction that the end of the world would occur on May the 21st. It didn't. And so now I fear we're kind of stuck with the world. We've got to figure it out. This would have been an easy way to avoid that problem, but it didn't happen to work out for us. And now we have to keep at it at least until December of 2012 when the Mayans predict that the world will end. So we've got a couple of years at least where we should worry about the world. And, and then of course there is the event which I consider to be the event with the most potential to change our culture and our civilization as we currently know it. And of course I'm speaking of the fascinator. Certainly we would have to agree that this is evidence of a failure of imagination, at least, <laughs> at least on our part. So I suppose what I would ask is, uh, as we reflect on it, is whether this year we consider the world to be safer, is it less complex, is it more stable, and is it more predictable than it was this time last year? And I think not. I think in the main we would have to say that the world is 
not safer, it is more complex, and it feels, uh, certainly feels more unpredictable. And yet, in that, in that feeling of unpredictability, we are faced with a new fiscal environment, new fiscal realities that, as General Sir Peter mentioned, cause us to reconsider the role of the military instrument of power, our missions and our capabilities, and do so in a way that makes the military instrument affordable for our nations. But at this point, I'd like to remind us collectively that this is not the first time we have faced similar challenges. Run the video for me, if you will. Eminem, Marshall Mathers, he uh, is quite a hit both in the United States and, and here, incidentally, in England. And there's a line in that, uh, in that video that I actually uh, I use a lot to remind myself of what we're doing, and the line is, holla if you feel like you've been down this road before. Now I have to say, it's probably the first and only time you'll ever hear a four-star general use the word holla. But that said, the rest of it is absolutely true. Holla if you feel like you've been down this road before. We have been down this road before. In our history, we've been down, in our, in our brief history compared to some of our our uh, international partners. We have been down this road before. We can figure it out. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of that because there are times when it feels that this, there's this overwhelming newness to these challenges, and there really shouldn't be. So we can figure it out. I will say that in social media jargon, the things that happen to us today go viral much more quickly than they did in the, in the past. The pace of events is accelerated. You know, there's a joke that my Arab colleague shared with me, and it goes something like this. What brought down Anwar Sadat? And the answer is, of course, an assassin's bullet. What brought down Saddam Hussein? A hangman's noose. And what brought down Mubarak? Facebook. And, and if, you think about, if you think about it, there's, abs there's absolutely validity to that. What brought down Mubarak was Facebook, social networking, a leaderless organization that rose up and we now call the Arab Spring. And so things can happen much more quickly than they have in the past. So in the context of this viral world, we are working to build an army, armies, that will meet requirements uh, in a way that is consistent with the guidance we've been, get, we've been given by our political leaders. And put up the slide to show you how similar the task at hand is for the United States and Great Britain. On the left, of course, is our quadrennial defense review, and on the right is the strategic defense and security review. And if you look side by side, if you look at them in that way side by side, you can see that we believe that the capabilities that we need are the same, essentially. Uh, it's, uh, the challenge for us is to determine in this new fiscal environment how do we take our, for, our current array of forces and map them, if you will. Link them to those requirements as they've been given to us. And where shall we put our weight of effort as we go forward? So what I'd like to do now is briefly, very briefly, talk about three focus areas that are helping shape our thinking about how we map ourselves uh, to these tasks. And the first is what I will describe as Army of 2020, and in fact, we know that General Sir Peter and, and General Sir David have taken the same approach in looking to the future. And, and we say 2020, importantly, because if we, if we allow ourselves to be consumed in the annual budget debate without understanding what we're trying to produce in the mid-future, we will not provide the capabilities that our nations need for the kind of emerging security challenges we face. So stated another way, we've got to leap beyond the current fiscal challenge to 2020. And I picked 2020 intentionally because it's, in our case, we picked it intentionally because it's the mid-future. And the mid-future is the future that people are kind of reluctant to talk about. People will always be willing to wax eloquently and sometimes not so eloquently about the challenges of today. And people will always be willing to chat, especially over a cocktail, about 2030, because it's so far in the future that whoever's speaking about it really won't be involved in delivering it. But 2020 is the time that leaders, the leaders in this room, will actually have to deliver an army 
to meet the nation's needs. In fact, the Chief of Staff of the Army in his four-year tenure will turn in four budgets in our system, one that carries us from 13 to 17, one that carries us from 14 to 18, 15 to 19, and 16 to 20. So whether I do so deliberately or inadvertently, I will build the Army of 2020 for the United States of America, as General Sir Peter will for the United Kingdom. So 2020 is exactly the right place to look. And I suspect, and in fact would assert, that the army we will build for 2020 will not be the army that our nations need in 2025. So what we're essentially saying is that we've got in this century, with the kind of viral effects and the rapidity of change and the, the cascading and, and merging of technologies, what we're saying is that we have to be agile enough to see ourselves and to adapt on a far tighter cycle than ever before in our history. And I think we can do that. I think we can do that. There are two competencies that we know we have to deliver for our nation. One of them is combined arms maneuver. An army must be able to maneuver. It cannot become a st static stationary force. The other competency is wide area security. It must be able, actually, to become a static stationary force. And that's the friction, that's the rub. How much of our effort do we put into building capabilities to maneuver forces, which tend, by the way, maneuver force warfare tends to be somewhat centralized, in fact, very centralized. How much of that do we need? And how much of the wide area security capability, which tends to be decentralized, where we push as much as we can to the edge and young leaders actually execute and deliver effects on the ground. It's not a heavy, light argument. It's not about heavy forces or light forces. It's about all forces capable of performing both maneuver and security. And staying understandable, connected to our societies, engaged, and expecting that they will have to change. The second item I'd like to talk with you about is the squad. I like to carry around images. Some I keep in my mind and some I keep in my pocket. But the point is, this image I think brings home for me in any case the challenge, our challenge of building the army of 2020. What you see here is a young squad leader in Afghanistan. And you can see a couple of things from the image. You first of all can see the that, that marvelous and almost mystical combination of emotions. There's courage and fear, there's confidence and there's uncertainty in that young man's face. But you can also see something even more important. You can see what our professions, the military profession, whether it's in the United States of America, the United Kingdom, in China, in Brazil, in France, in Germany, wherever we find it, the military profession is built on trust. And this, if there were a single caption for this picture, it would be trust. You can see that the soldier beyond the squad leader is protecting his flank, and that requires a degree of trust. You can see that the squad leader is calling for something, probably not for takeout pizza. He's probably calling for a medevac helicopter, or for close air support, or for indirect fire, or for guidance. And he trusts that he will get what he needs. You can see that he wears a wedding band, and so he trusts that someone is caring for his family and that he'll have medical care for himself and for them long after this conflict is done. And that's a level of trust on which our profession is built that as we go forward to build this army that we, we break at our great peril. If we don't preserve trust, we lose this thing we call a profession. And then we do have problems. The other thing about this picture is that it does show a part of a squad. And one of the things we're trying to do in the United States Army is look at the Army from the bottom up. You know, we want to lie on our back and look up, not sit at some elevated perch and look down. Because the kind of conflict that we think we will be facing in that period of 2020 will largely be executed at the lowest tactical level and therefore we best understand what it takes to empower that young man or young woman to execute their duties. So the second 
focus area that I've mentioned here today is this idea of the squad. Next slide, please. And finally, last year I spoke about leader development. And this year I will speak to you about leader development. And if you invite me back next year, I will speak to you about leader development. And that's because we are almost certain, in fact, I would, I would venture to say we are certain to get our organizational design a little Guinness, as the phrase goes. And we're likely to get our equipment to be issued in a way that is not exactly what our soldiers need, where, where they need it. And, and sadly, we're probably likely to give guidance a little bit late. And so in that context, the young man or woman who knits that all together, who takes those imprecise organizational designs, that equipment that is almost good enough, and takes guidance that sometimes is unclear, and puts it together and delivers, is a leader. And so if we get our leader development programs correct, then everything else that we do will have a happy ending, as we say. So as part of our campaign of learning, as we call it, we feel we're on a campaign of learning we believe in, in the United States Army that the one domain in which we must be excellent is in the domain of learning. That that's where we must concentrate our efforts in these times of uncertainty. So we've discovered or rediscovered a couple of things. One of the things we've rediscovered is this idea of what it means to be part of a profession. And we're working hard to understand how our policies and how our attributes and how our leader development strategies build towards something that young men and women, as General Sir Peter mentioned, want to be part of, feel like they belong to, and make a commitment to, uh, even after the sound of gunfire fades in, in, as an echo. And we've discovered that we have to force ourselves to focus on fundamentals. We have to break the tyranny of and the proliferation of task lists everybody publishes a list for these young leaders of things they must accomplish and what we've got to do is we've got to trust them give them broader guidance and allow them to operate within it and we've got to understand how learning technologies can help us develop leaders smart technologies how many of you have a smartphone I hope it's turned off but how if you had one in here how many of you do have a smartphone about the same number, well, that's actually more. More people than knew about M&M. But if you Googled M&M on your smartphone, you'd have known the answer to my question. <laughs> well, last year I introduced, by way of closing, last year I introduced the phrase failure of imagination. I want to introduce a phrase this year as well because it's something I'm newly interested in since last year, and that is I've become interested in how to develop in leaders something described as passionate curiosity. Albert Einstein, a passably successful scientist, said this, I have no special talent, I am only passionately curious. Elaborating on that thought, he said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of the mysteries around him every day never lose a holy curiosity. I believe that in confronting the uncertain and complex future ahead, and as they've struggled to understand the challenges in Iraq and Afghanistan, our leaders do have today, our junior leaders do have a passionate curiosity. Our task is to continue to nurture it, to build on it, and to seek it as an attribute, to deliberately seek it as an attribute in our leader development strategies. The stakes are high because if we don't deliberately seek it, we will inadvertently squash it. As a start, I've instructed battalion and brigade commanders in the United States Army to do two things. To put white space on calendars, space that isn't filled with something. Hold junior leaders accountable for filling it, but let them fill it. And the second thing I told them that I want injected into every training event is chaos. Now, one might argue it's already there. But if it's not there, I want it injected into our training because it's in confronting uncertainty, unpredictability, chaos that our junior leaders do two things important to us. They grow and they feel like they're developing. 
And so that's the two things we're doing to try to capture this passionate curiosity. So let me end by with one final image, an image of American soldiers and British soldiers side by side through history. And I'll, I'll echo what President Barack Obama said in a recent visit, we have a shared history, we have shared values, and I think that means we definitely have a shared future. Thank you very much.